Hello, and my name is Glenn Chestnut. I am the lead minister of the Church of St Andrew and St Paul here in downtown Montreal. And thank you for finding us online. It seems to be the new reality for many churches as we grapple with COVID-19. Because we are no longer able to meet in more than groups of two, we have changed our online format for you. Nevertheless, we hope you find your time with us, an enjoyable time, a worthwhile time, and also a meaningful time, albeit different to the way we normally gather present in church. You can follow the flow of our services online, and we have our orders of service there for you to participate in, in either saying responses or indeed singing the hymns. Many people are now not able to attend their own place of worship. Others are searching for a place at a time of uncertainty. May I ask you to take some time and maybe share our Facebook pages, our YouTube channel and our website with them. And please do check our different online platforms from time to time. We will try and update you as best as we are possible on what is an ongoing uh, situation. May I also ask you to reflect upon how you might be able to support us online and especially the people behind the scenes who are making this experience possible. It's important for all of us to be assured at this time that we belong, that we belong to a community, in this instance, a community of faith online. So you are welcome. You are welcome no matter who you are, and you are welcome no matter where you are. Let us gather together in prayer. Let us pray. God of all times and all places, worshipping like this doesn't feel normal. We yearn for other voices with whom to sing, other ears to hear our words, other hands to touch ours, other spirits with whom to reach out to you. Instead, we gather in our homes in front of screens alone or with family, but not with our church community. Yet, God, we are grateful that we are not alone. Your Spirit never recognizes walls or doors, but bursts through closed rooms to inflame hearts and inflate spirits. You chose not to be a God who would rule from a distance, but would come close, filling every space with your presence. You were the one who knows our deepest sighs of sadness, our greatest joys of victory, our emptiest abysses of loneliness, our inmost panic of fear. And you love us because of and in spite of it all. Rather than turning our back on us, you came even closer in the person of Jesus Christ, choosing to experience human life in all its triumphs and losses. So as we gather today, we praise you that you transcend its strangeness and miraculously bring us together into one body to glorify you and enjoy you as your people. Gracious one, we confess that it is easy to be overwhelmed by this current pandemic and all that it has brought us. The news media stirs up our fears. Our own circumstances bring stress for those facing unemployment and uncertainty and boredom and tedium for others. With so much attention on our own condition, it is difficult for us to think of the needs of others whose needs may be far greater than our own. We let despair nibble at the corners of our hope, suspicion weave into the tapestry of trust, anxiety undercut our wings of faith. And so we turn to Jesus Christ. He is our hope, the one who resolutely carried on even when the world turned against him, the one who carried love and forgiveness to the cross, who showed us that fear, despair, 
Suspicion and anxiety never have the last word, but life does in resurrection. Keep us all safe in these trying times, God, when the enemy is not some nation, but an unseen virus. Give us strength to face these trials, compassion to ease the burdens of others, and vision to see beyond the concerns of this moment to the great realm of love to which you call us. And now we join together in the Lord's Prayer that has gathered Christians together in one voice over all the centuries. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Première lecture, psaume 130 Du fond de l'abîme, je t'invoque, ô Éternel. Seigneur, écoute ma voix. Que tes oreilles soient attentives à la voix de mes supplications. Si tu gardais le souvenir des iniquités, Éternel, Seigneur, qui pourrait subsister? Mais le pardon se trouve auprès de toi afin qu'on te craigne. J'espère en l'Éternel, mon âme espère, et j'attends sa promesse. Mon âme compte sur le Seigneur plus que les gardes ne comptent sur le matin. Israël, mets ton espoir en l'Éternel, car la miséricorde est auprès de l'Éternel, 
et la rédemption est auprès de lui en abondance. C'est lui qui rachètera Israël de toutes ses iniquités. Ainsi se termine la première lecture. Nous rendons grâce à Dieu. The second lesson is from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37, reading verses 1 to 14. Let us listen for the word of God. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and sent me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were all very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked 
and there were sinews on them, and the flesh had come upon them, and the skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophecy to the breath, prophecy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he had commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring up you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from the graves, O my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us again gather ourselves in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and compassionate God, for many of us, these are long and lonely days Days full of worry and concern, both for ourselves and for others. Now that the daily flurry of new closures and disclosures has slowed, and we settle into this time of isolation, quarantine, and caution, with which we shall live for at least the next weeks, we find it difficult to escape from negative thoughts and fears about how we will survive this time mentally and physically. And so it is even more important in these days that we turn in thanksgiving to you so that our perspective does not become too warped. We thank you that the signs of spring are not being held back by this virus, that robins, geese, and blackbirds are not put into quarantine when they flew across the American border, that the sun's warming rays are not subject to social distancing but reach down to touch our face and hands that the disappearance of winter's snow provides a hopeful sign that one day this virus will also melt away. And we are thankful that your love never, never fails. As we continue our Lenten journey, moving closer and closer to Jerusalem with Jesus, we know violent and hate-filled moments await. And yet with the crucifixion, just when things were at their bleakest, when hope was lost, you raised Christ from death. We thank you that in Christ you proclaimed that nothing would stand between you and us, even death. We turn our prayers to our thoughts for others. We pray for governments throughout the world, that they might use the insights of science and compassion for citizens to make decisions that protect us and guide us through this crisis. We pray for scientists seeking a vaccine, for workers producing much needed hospital equipment, for cleaners trying their best to sanitize surfaces, for workers in essential services, cashiers, shelf stockers, drivers, and others who put their own health at risk to provide us with what we need. Keep them all healthy and strong during these difficult days. We pray for the millions now out of work, wondering how they will survive financially, that they might receive the resources to continue. We pray for health care workers, PABs, nurses, and doctors. We ask that they and their families be protected, that they not be overwhelmed by the difficulties and dangers that they face. 
And we pray for, pray for those who are sick with more and more each day that they might have the medical care they need and also the spiritual care that will hold them up during their illness. We pray for all of us practicing self-isolation, for those living alone, for families with young children feeling cooped up, for those in situations where tension is high, and now finding no escape from conflict. For all of us feeling imprisoned in ways to which we are not accustomed, may each of us find resources to bring us through and to connect us in new ways with one another. And now we bring to you those who are on our minds, especially those close to us, but whom we are unable to see or touch. In a moment of silence, we give them to you, our God of compassion. Finally, we thank you again for the comfort of knowing that countless generations of the faithful lived lives of hope in the midst of much more difficult challenges. For their witness and the hope of eternity with which they lived and died, we find hope and strength. We pray all this through the crucified and resurrected one, Jesus Christ. Amen. the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many years ago, when I worked in a children's home in Jamaica, I encountered a young teenager called Ben. Ben had come from a very difficult and violent background and had been in the home since early childhood. He was despondent and distant from most of the other boys and indeed the staff. 
I noticed that he would often spend time on his own in a corner of the orphanage. One day I happened upon him and asked him what he was doing. He rather awkwardly and without saying pointed to a wooden box on its side with the opening facing towards us. The opening was covered with chicken wire and as I peered inside I saw three birds. As a child I had had many pets and I immediately identified the birds as fan-tailed pigeons. The fact that I knew what breed the birds were seemed in some way to endear me to Ben. And so he opened up and told me where the pigeons had come from. Each time his father visited him, he would bring Ben a pigeon. Ben told me that he was looking forward to having a fourth pigeon one day. This is a very powerful story of hope amidst seeming despair because it's about a lonely and isolated little boy who had very little but nevertheless clung to hope. The hope that one day he would see his father again. And he used his fan-tailed pigeons as embodiments of that hope. In the book of Ezekiel, the Israelite exiles in Babylon were isolated and in crisis. But the crisis was not only about physical oppression and suffering, or indeed communal identity. The fact is that by the time this part of Ezekiel was written, most of the exiles from Israel were free to lead their lives relatively openly. They could marry, they could build homes, they could work, they could even govern themselves, and importantly, they could worship. But that was the problem. Many of them felt they couldn't worship in a way that they had done back in Israel. You see, the key symbols of their faith, Jerusalem, its temple, its people, and the Davidic monarchy, had been destroyed by the Babylonians, thus leaving many of the Israelites to question whether their deity had been strong enough and faithful enough. So we are told in Ezekiel chapter 37 that they cried out to God and said, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost and we are cut off completely. The people saw no hope and no future in worshipping a God that wasn't strong enough to help them. In response, God's spirit takes their prophet Ezekiel to a valley, a valley filled with dry bones, and says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, I shall cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act. God instructed his prophet to stand in the middle of a pile of dry bones and tell them that God would bring them back to life. This imagery of full human life coming back from dry bones was God's way of telling the captive people of Israel, telling them not to give hope up hope in their God, but rather to believe and to have faith in their God, and also in a future with their God. Paul, in the book of Romans, puts it a slightly different way, and he says this, It was by hope that we were saved. But if we see that we hope for, then it is not really hope. For who hopes for something he sees? But if we hope for something we do not see, we wait for it in patience. Like those Israelites of old, we find ourselves in a type of Babylon, a place of captivity and isolation at the moment, where one could be forgiven for losing hope. As we try to cope with social distancing, 
economic uncertainty and anxiety, possibly over finding basic necessities such as food and healthcare even. And like Ezekiel, when we look out across this valley of dry bones, that is our situation today, it would be understandable if we, like Ezekiel, were uncertain whether there is any hope for these bones at all. But as M. Craig Barnes writes, the church has always found its life not in what it sees today, but in the spirit of the God who raises dead hopes. He goes on to say, The day that we lose our ability to envision a better tomorrow is the day that we deny that we really believe in the resurrection. So let us cling on to the belief in a better tomorrow. Let us cling on to the hope that God's Spirit is at work in our world today. And let us give thanks for those who embody that hope. Our frontline healthcare workers and those racing to find a vaccine against COVID-19. Those risking their own health in trying to enhance other people's lives by caring for them and by providing daily needs. And may we give thanks for leadership at every level of society as we all strive for the common good. May we do those things with the belief that our God is not done with us. Our God is not done with us, our country and indeed our world. Rather, may we come alongside Ezekiel who had faith in God and in God's power. May we come alongside Ezekiel and proclaim our hope to those dry bones of our context by saying, along with Ezekiel, Thus says the Lord, I will cause breath to enter you, and you will live. May we be empowered by God's Spirit to believe so, as it is to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we give praise and glory, indeed today and forevermore. Amen.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you, both now today and indeed forevermore. Amen.